Welcome or welcome back to Trail and All Training and Training. My name is Will Franz, and the whole goal of this podcast is to help you train a little better so you can have more fun doing the sport we love of trail running. If you appreciate this or feel that you get some value out of this, I would love if you subscribed or shared it with somebody or left a rating or review or the whole spiel that we've all heard a thousand times by now on the internet. Anyway, today I would love to talk about a deload, and some signs that you might need one. I think there are 10 of them. Uh, I didn't try to like juice that number. It's just kind of actually what came to my brain. Um, past couple weeks, coming off a little bit of sickness, and then just generalized anxiety. Um, I have taken some step back in training volume, and that is really what we're talking about when we talk about a deload. It is a reduction in training volume, ideally so we can get a like better long-term adaptation because it is, it is very difficult to string together a like perfect training ramp up in a way to where a deload wouldn't be helpful. And there are some studies done on people, um, largely in the strength community, but a couple in endurance where if we, if we thread the needle perfectly and um, just ramp up less, like we used to have this idea where you had to create this like over, uh, over stimulus um, and you'd push a little hard and then you'd back off and then you'd let that adaptation occur and then you'd push really hard and then you'd back off and then you'd let that adaptation occur. And they've shown that you can also make a more, I don't know, linear progression where you don't quite push as hard, but you also don't take the deload. So you end up in the same place. I hope that made sense. And I, I don't think that the latter is easy to do. It's not that we shouldn't kind of strive for that in some ways. If you really like to run a good amount and you want to keep your volume up, but I also don't think we should demonize the the need for a deload when it happens. It might not be this like three weeks on, one week off strategy that is really common because it came to prominence in the like seventies and eighties through. Olympic lifting teams in Russia. And I mean, there's a lot of things that make that complicated uh, between steroids and the fact that it was Olympic lifting teams trying to cross over training mechanistics to runners and whatever. There's a lot of things that make that not perfect. Not, not to mention just like individual variants. Like some people are going to do really well with a six, seven, eight week build. And then other people are going to need recovery more often just because like age and genetics and all sorts of things um, that will force you to have to adapt your training to fit you, because that's what we have to do. But a deload is not a bad thing. Um, it is good to train hard and create a stimulus and then let that stimulus take hold in your body by allowing for an adaptation to happen, right? We can do a deload in multiple ways. It can literally just be a switch in training phases. So if we're going to do some sort of deload in um, a strength phase, we could just switch the phase. So instead of going really heavy and then taking a deload and going back to heavy, like that might be what you do for a while if you're looking at powerlifting because heavy has to be a like very consistent form of training. But if we're looking more at like a hybrid athlete or someone really trying to improve themselves for running, we'll do like three or four weeks of a heavy phase. And then we just don't do that heavy phase anymore. <laughs> we come out of it and we can target something else so we can still get muscle stimulation and adaptation without necessarily having to take a full week off. Now, another way we can do it would be to like uses as an excuse to re-stimulate another energy system. So if you look at the 50K plan I have out, you'll notice I do a deload, I don't know, however many weeks. And 
it's somewhere between four and six. It kind of depends on the phase. And I deload volume, so we cut overall running, mileage, time, whatever, down. And if we look at the like space between the two, or like lactate phases, um, lactate phase one, and then between two, we like cut volume quite a bit. The long run goes down, and use that as a, an excuse to like re-stimulate a VO2 max workout. So we kind of keep that energy system up. It can also just be a week off. You're not going to lose much in a week. If you're taking a week off every other week, we probably have an issue as far as your overall development as someone training. But they have done studies where people take um, a week off every three or four weeks, and there's really no difference between their development and the development of someone who either did a deload or kept training constantly. You can take a week off every, I don't know, four to six weeks, and it won't really negative effect, negatively affect your training, especially if it allows you to train better and harder during the weeks that you really are taking seriously. Now, that was done in untrained people. I probably would not recommend, I know I, for a fact, I wouldn't recommend that to a professional athlete, but we can accept that most of us are not professional athletes and take a week off if we really need it, right? So deloads can, I also don't schedule them. And I think I've mentioned this in the past. I definitely put out an email on this recently, but life hands them to you. Like I got sick a few weeks ago and that's one of the reasons that kicked off this whole deload period for me. Um, I see a lot of that with a lot of the people I coach, like you get sick, your kid gets sick, your dog gets sick. Sometimes you get all of those three things happen in the same week. And it's really tough to uh, get training in when everything is just kind of falling apart. So if here are some signs that we might need a deload because again, I don't really program them. We just kind of run by what the body needs um, by releasing a preset program on the internet. You're almost always going to see a deload in there because without one, it would be somewhat irresponsible. But when I'm thinking about individual people, I very rarely like have this three week on one week off structure because we have to adapt to the needs of the person at hand, right? And that can look very different from person to person based on um, a whole variety of factors, right? So if you run some of your own training and you're not quite sure what might be an indicator that you need a deload, let's talk about a few of them. So one would be like you've un inexplicably hit a plateau or you're actually starting to see a regression in your training. So this would be workouts keep getting faster, you keep getting faster, you're adding volume and mileage, and all these things are feeling really easy. And then one week, like everything just kind of stops progressing. We hit this like solid plateau, or you might have even gotten slower. If we look at like normal graded pace or something like that on Training Peaks or whatever software you use you might see a, a drop-off in how well you're uh, performing. And that would be a really good indicator that it might be time for a break. Another one, number two, is you hate the idea of training or like, and getting out there doesn't make it better. Like, this is a really important thing. I struggle to some degree with, like, the initiation cost feels very high for me in a lot of activities in life. I think it's probably just some level of brain chemistry. I mean, we're all kind of built the way we're built. And like the initiating cost for me for dopamine is a rough bag. So a lot of the time I do have to convince myself to start things that I know I will like. And training is often one of them. However, once I get out there, I often feel a lot better until I really need a deload. And then I get out there and it still sucks. So if you hate the idea of training, you dread training, and you get out there and it still sucks, then you almost certainly need a deload for no other reason than for your mental health. Like, it's time for time for a break. Again, you're allowed to take a break. We're not going to see this big back off uh, of progress just because we take a week break. 
three. So you're just tired all the time. Like if you're just tired all the time, then we should appreciate what your body's telling you and take take a step back. Um, sometimes you just need a week to reset. Sometimes you need more food. Sometimes we need to figure out some structures in our life that allow us to get our daily bullshit done in a way that allows us to train better. Um, I definitely use sickness as <laughs> an excuse to start a couple new systems. I've started using some new software for strength training that has been great, but whenever you start using new software, like uploading everything into it is tedious. Let's call it tedious and long. So you can use some of these times to restructure other systems in life in a way that makes your training uh, easier and more efficient and effective, right? So if you're just tired all the time, take a break. Um, Four would be stress is way higher than normal. And this really matters. I would like to um, point out that as much as we talk about supplements and recovery things and whatever modalities, massage guns and Normatec boots and blah, 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 there's like three things that actually expedite recovery. Sleep, four. Food, hydration, and stress reduction tactics. Like if you are stressed, if you're in this like high level sympathetic tone all the time of your nervous system, like we cannot really adapt. We need to be able to step back and let our body create the recovery stuff that we need to create in order to actually make progress. If we don't recover, we don't get better. You don't get better in the workout. You get better when you adapt from the workout. And if you're stressed all the time, you're not going to adapt from the workout. So if we're in a place of training or in a place of life where stress is cranked through the roof, like something is going on at work or your kid's getting expelled from school or your dog's really sick, any of these things that might be happening and might need to use that as a deload time. Now, this is also like not to confuse us for... Stress is always high, like the world is hard, <laughs> and um, life is kind of hard, and if we never did anything when life was chaotic, we would never do anything. So we have to understand what our baseline is, but we also have to have some tactics to make that baseline lower. If your stress is always high, then we need to reduce it no matter what like that might involve. And if we can't do that, and maybe right now isn't the time to train for an ultra. Next, um, hunger stuff. Hunger stuff is what we're going to call this one. Hunger signals like are not where they used to be. You're hungry all the time, or you're you have cravings for food that you don't normally like um, or enjoy, or you're never hungry even though you're training really heavily. So you can like have this on either end, but. We have this normalized hunger level for you, whatever that may mean, and it's off of that normal, and we aren't able to eat in a way that allows us to foster good recovery and adaptation, might be time to take a deload and allow ourselves to get that food, figure out some systems that allow us to get that food in on the regular, even when we might not be hungry. Six, you have excessive aches and pains in weird places. Let's call it that. Your legs are going to probably be sore if you're running up mountains a lot. It's not that weird if your quads are tired. It's not that weird if your glutes are tired. If you're climbing a lot of mountains, your calves might be feeling things. If we're talking weird places, like this might be your hip flexors are always taxed. Um, you feel it in your joints, your tendons those kind of things. Your low back is tweaked. These are things that should not be achy and painy. Uh, they should serve as a pretty solid structure on which your muscles can do a ton of work. And if we're feeling a lot of aches and pains in these structures that allow, don't allow us to function well, then we should take a step back and figure out what we need to do to recover. Number seven, so your digestion's off. Again, like think about hunger. This is a wide range here, but there's this old Pepto-Bismol commercial that was like nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea. Any of these things are a pretty good indicator that something's up, right? 
probably add constipation to that list. But if, des if digestion is not going well, we need to fix some food things. Stress also greatly affects your digestion, so we might need to fix some stress and some sleep things. But if your digestion is super tweaked, then you're probably not going to be absorbing nutrients really well. Like gut health really does matter. We don't really know what that <laughs> pardon me, we don't really know what that means. So that is a tough thing to, you know, really be clear about when we talk about gut health. Like the, the gut microbiome is vast and confusing. And I feel like it's this big trend on the internet and podcasts and social space to act like we know exactly what it needs when we don't. We can see when changes happen. We have a good idea uh, that like a diversity of gut flora is is good. We have a pretty great idea that fiber is really good for you. But beyond that, we don't know a lot. Uh, gut health is a tough thing to identify. And a lot of people will make wide sweeping claims about the gut microbiota when we genuinely just don't know much about it other than it matters. However, we do know that uh, nausea, heartburn, indigestion, upset stomach, diarrhea, and constipation are not a fun time. Uh, we know that they tend to make us run worse and feel worse on a day-to-day -day basis, and it probably means that we're not going to be eating and or absorbing the nutrients that we need to be eating and absorbing. So if your digestion is causing you problems, then we need to fix that, and it could be coming from an excessive training load. Eight is your sleep is off. If you do not, if you, whatever this means for you, right? So most of us probably don't sleep enough anyway. I know I don't. I am a massive hypocrite when it comes here. Um, and it's probably a reason I, you know, get sick and I'm tired quite a lot of the time. So don't be like me. Be better than me. But if you have sleep struggles, then, I mean, we have some idea of what your normalized sleep would be, right? Like some of this is going to be dictated by your life. But if you get a solid seven hours and you usually feel pretty good, let's say you feel 90% most days, you wake up, you're slightly tired, but you don't feel like you've been shot by a tranquilizer, let's call, it, let's call that normal for most people, unfortunately. I would love to say that normal for most people is whatever amount of sleep you need, you pop right out of bed, ready to go, and excited. Uh, but I realize that's probably not the world we live in, so let's call it 80 to 90% good, where you're just like... Today's an okay day. I'm going to drink some coffee and uh, move forward and feel fine. And then something goes worse than that. And instead of having that level of general energy in the morning, you do feel like you've been shot by a tranquilizer every day. Um, you're really tired. You don't want to get up. You hit the snooze button six times and um, it becomes a general struggle probably an indicator that we're under-recovered and under-sleeping for whatever reason. It doesn't matter. Um, it could be overtraining. It could be food things. It could be a lot of stress. It could be you're kind of sick, so you don't breathe super well, so your sleep's not really good. Any of these things would be a good indicator for, or a good reason for your sleep to be causing problems. And if your sleep's causing problems, again, not creating that adaptation, so let's step back a little bit and find a level to which we can actually adapt. Number nine, you have a irregular libido, whatever that would be for you. We don't need to get super into your sex life here, but you have a general idea of what your normalized libido would be. And if it is uh, way lower than that, then you're probably leading towards overtraining because this is one of the first things that is going to tank when we are over leveraging other hormones, right? So this is actually a metric that beyond just you know, like it being a healthy part of most normal people, more normal adult lives, it is also a, a metric for how your hormones are doing. Because if your testosterone and estrogen are through the floor, because cortisol is super high, because we're overtraining, then your libido is also going to tank. So this is a good indicator for a lot of people that we might be seeing some issues. Now, if you're on what we might call the like asexual version of the of the gender of the spectrum of things, then maybe this is not an issue for you. But for most most people, this is a good indicator. And then ten, um, you're in 
Uh, like, you're just pissy. You're in a bad mood all the time. Uh, a pretty good indicator that something is wrong. And that might mean you need a therapist. It might mean you need to take a deload. But if we are just not feeling good, then it probably means we need to adjust something. And one of those things might be your training. So those are 10 signs you might need a deload. And again, I don't really schedule deloads. I think they're a great idea. I think weaving the perfect or the weaving the like threading the needle is what I'm trying to say of this like perfect linear training progression is damn near impossible unless you've been training for a very long time, know your exact needs and really have a lot of data off which you can run. And then I still think it's going to be really tough to train hard enough to get a stimulus while also not needing a deload. Again, possible, but very difficult. So take one when you need one. If you need one every, if you need one every third week, great. We can like create this stepwise building function. If you need one every eight weeks, great. If you need one after four weeks, one training block and eight weeks, the next training block, also great. If we have a good idea of what signs to look for and the things in our life that tend to initiate a deload process, then we can do better in our training because we can adapt it to us and what we actually need rather than this like generalized 3-1 on-off cycle that is popular on the internet for no other reason than it's just really easy to program, right? So I hope this was helpful. I am going to get some food and get to work. I hope you have a great rest of your day and have fun out on the trails. Thank you again for listening to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Podcast. I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Just a reminder, nothing you hear on this podcast is medical advice, and you should always speak with a medical professional before making changes to your training or your nutrition. If you enjoyed the podcast or found it helpful, please leave a rating or review. It tells the algorithm robots that people like it, and that means more people will hear it. Or even better, just share it with someone who you think would benefit. If you prefer a video version, head to the Trail and Ultra Running Training Group on Facebook or check out the Mountain Goat Endurance Coaching YouTube channel. Thank you again. I hope you have a great next run.